Let us pray. Father, we approach you tonight and we thank you for the opportunities that we have to uh, just put the world's troubles aside and to open your, the scripture and the word and to uh, learn more about what you have uh, for us and as Christians to live the life according to your word and according to uh, the way in which we know uh, that we should. We thank you for the means in which we have to worship you and wherever we may be, Father, that we pray that uh, this time is a uh, time well spent. We thank you for the leaders of this congregation, Father, and the wisdom and the foresight uh, for which they've been able to put these avenues in place, and we ask for special blessings that they continue to do uh, the work that they've been uh, charged to do. We thank you for Larry and his family and what they mean to this congregation and uh, the work that they put in as well, Father, to do your work day in and day out. Father, we're mindful of the efforts of this congregation, and we ask for special blessings on each of those efforts, uh, especially during this time of uh, such uh, hardship and, and, uh, and uh, uncertainty as we uh, go about continuing to minister to this community. Uh, we pray that uh, our efforts will be recognized and that uh, through those, we'll be blessed as a congregation. Mindful of those that have been mentioned, we pray for uh, well-being and uh, and that your healing hand will continue to touch them in the ways in which they need you most. We're also mindful, Father, of those needs that have not been made known. We know that uh, you know them well before we even ask, and we pray that you would continue to intervene in those situations. Bless them, make your presence known uh, for blessings that they know can only come from you, Father. And as we continue to uh, study your word, we pray as we leave today that uh, we will be having better uh, having tuned in and to listen to uh, the word. We pray that we can apply this to our lives, Father, and find opportunities uh, to make uh, opportunities to reach out to those that uh, are in desperate need, Father, of knowing uh, what it means to be a Christian and what it means to abide in you. We ask for forgiveness in those times where we've recognized opportunities and not taken advantage of those, and we pray that we do that less and less. And, and, uh, we open our, uh, we, we, we find that courage, Father, to reach out and to bring those uh, people to uh, know you. Be with us as we, as we go about our business this week, Father. Continue to bless, uh, bless uh, us and our opportunities in those places where we find, uh, uh, find those uh, present. We are mindful of the world turning their attention to you, Father, and we pray that they not do these on just special occasions, but they find the need uh, to turn to you each and every day, Father, and continue to be with us, Father. Bless us as only you can. We ask for these in your Son's most holiest of names. Amen. So glad morning when this life is over.
If you were an artist and I were going to give you a, a canvas, a paintbrush, and some paint, and I asked you to paint a picture of God, at least what you think he looks like based upon what we have in the Bible of his traits and his characteristics, could you paint an honest depiction of God? I think it would be impossible to give every characteristic of God in a sermon. However, I think that we can certainly use his word to acquire a better picture or a portrait of who God really is. James Deeney, who was a Scottish preacher, teacher, and theologian, in teaching his students, told him in, to, to caution against learning all they could about God because during their studies, he said, gentlemen, he would tell them to study infinity requires eternity. And certainly when we think about that, we can learn God from the standpoint of what he gives us in his word, that which makes us complete, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. But I think we could certainly go to God to learn who he is and who God is to us. First and foremost, God is eternal. He always is and he always will be. God is the only eternal being and he has been called the Alpha and the Omega. And if there was a time in which absolutely nothing existed, then we can rest assured that nothing would exist today. And so we know that God has always been there, God will always be there, and he will always exist. Simply put, nothing produces nothing as we hear a lot in the scientific community. But we know that the universe does exist, so logic follows that something had to create that which we experience every day. We can look around us and we can see the beauty of creation in which God has blessed us with. And we can see that God is eternal in that which he's provided for us. Because not only is God eternal, God is also a creator. Even though atheism and evolution and humanism are actively promoted within the schools and in the media and on social media and those things in which we read today, we understand the complexity of life clearly points us to God as the creator of all things that life is sustained, sustained within. Evolution cannot explain how life allegedly evolved from non-life. They can give all of these theories, and, and I studied wildlife biology in school, and I took all of these classes, and they can allegedly try to explain based upon a quote-unquote theory, but there is no proof but simply that which they believed happened. Again, going back to the simple premise that you cannot get something from nothing. And so we think about Psalm chapter 33 and verse 6 where it says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Jump down to verse 9 of Psalm 33. For he spoke and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. We also read in Psalm 148 and verse 5, Let them praise the name of the Lord for he commanded and those things were created. Exodus 20 and verse 11, Moses writes, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all those things that are in them. And so we can see just as we read in Acts, as Paul is ex explaining to the, to the people as he's standing on Mars Hill there, what do we see? God is the creator and the giver of life. Indeed, everything around us is the product of his handiwork. Well, not only is... God is alive and certainly the sustainer of all things and the creator of everything. God is alive for us as his children. You Think about during natural disasters of, of crisis, many individuals question the existence of God and they want to argue that either he never existed or, or, or that now he's dead because there's no way that a loving God that's living would allow things like this to happen. And there it shall be said to them, you are the sons of the living God, Hosea 1 and verse 10. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you of an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. God is not the God of the dead, but a living God, Matthew chapter 22, verses 21 through 23, or 31 through 32. And so God is a living spirit. We think about how God is alive and desires people to worship him. John 4, verses 23 and 24. But the hour is coming, and now when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks, what? Is seeking those to worship him. God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So the scriptures divulge to us that God is alive. And so the eternal nature of God demands that we are servants of a living God. And so as we continue to paint this picture of which that that the Bible describes for us concerning his characteristics, we begin to see better who God is and how he reveals himself to us. The wonderful thing about God not only being our creator and being alive is that 
God is love. Our whole relationship is based upon the idea and the concept of what love is. Thanks to God's incredible love, 1 John 4, 8, humanity has been endowed with free will. Right As we look at Genesis chapter 2 in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15 where, God, where Joshua states to those in which he's speaking, he says, as for me and my house, we have a choice, Joshua says, and we choose to serve God. Why? Because we love God and God is love because he's expressed it for, towards us. But God commends or shows his love towards us that even when we were sinners, he sent Christ to die for us, Romans 5, 8. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? We read in 1 John, or excuse me, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Knowing God through love is really what John's talking about here. But love, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this love, God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son to be that propitiation or the atonement for our sins. And so, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. His love has also provided a means for salvation for all men because 2 Peter 3.9 tells us that God wants all men to be saved. So that's an expression or an outpouring of love towards mankind, even though mankind has sinned against God, of which he had to put his perfect son on Calvary to die for our sins. Again, 1 John 4 and verse 10 there, that he is that propitiation or the atonement. We understand that God is expressing love towards all of humanity. And so in addition, his love can strengthen and sustain us as we are faithful to him. Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. We seek because we love him and because God expresses that love towards us. Love, the love of God has been demonstrated for all men. One can't read the account of the crucifixion without the knowledge of just how much God loves us. You can read the entire account of the crucifixion through the horrible scourging of which Jesus endured and all of the things that he did for us even to the point of enduring the painful death on the cross of Calvary, knowing that God did all of that because God is love. God is also holy. Not only is he the creator and he's love, he's also holy. After Isaiah described the Lord and the, the seraphim that was surrounding him, Isaiah concluded, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, Isaiah 6.5. And we understand from 1 Peter 1 and verse 16 that God certainly is holy, is he not? And sin separates man from God that we read in Isaiah chapter 15 or 59, the first two verses. And so the holiness of God is frequently referenced in the Bible, but you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel, Psalm 22 and verse 3. The, the, the prophet Isaiah even noted, but the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment and God who is holy shall be hallowed in righteousness, Isaiah 5 and verse 16. So we can see the examples given to us in, in just a few verses of the prophet Isaiah of how important it is that God is holy for us, that he's pure, right? Moses wrote, for I am the Lord your God, you shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy for I am holy, Isaiah 5, or excuse me, Leviticus 11 and verse 44. And even Paul said, be ye holy as what? I am holy, and as I exemplify the example of who God is. And so the acknowledge of holiness of God is one of the first keys to, of obedience. I acknowledge that God is perfect in all things, so therefore for myself to approach the throne room of God through prayer, through my life and sacrificial service, I must present myself therefore as holy. And so that concept of knowing that characteristic of God as that portrait continues to be painted is important for us to know that God is holy. I'm, I'm certainly grateful that one of God's characteristics is that he's long-suffering. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3.9. Moses recorded the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, Numbers 14 and verse 18. So God is patient with us, right? Thankfully, the Lord is patient with mankind because he could have wiped us off the face of the earth and destroyed it a long time ago. 
but God wants as many of those in which he created to be with him in eternity. This characteristic is reiterated for us in the New Testament. Again, looking at 2 Peter 3, 9, God doesn't want anyone to perish. He truly wants all men to be faithful servants to him. He's expressing that form of who he is and what God's makeup is, is that God wants us to be with him, so therefore he's affording mankind the distinct opportunity to come unto the knowledge of what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And that all men everywhere should repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And so because God is long-suffering, that means God is also just. Fortunately, God is a righteous judge, and we want God to be a merciful judge towards us when we make mistakes. But unlike some judges that are adorning courtroom benches today, God cannot be bought, swayed, or tricked. You see, God is a just and righteous judge. God is not a respecter of persons that we see Peter recording or that the Bible records for us as Peter says in Acts chapter 10, 34 and 35. Remember, Peter said, as I perceive, God is not a respecter of person. If he wants me to preach to the Gentiles, therefore I will preach to the Gentiles and teach them accordingly. It is this just God who we will face on the appointed day of judgment, right? Hebrews 9 and verse 27 says, It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. We all must appear and stand before God on that day of judgment. 1 John 4 and verse 17, what's it say for us? Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And so because God is just, his judgment will be just and it will be final. There's no do-overs once we stand before God in his judgment seat, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. Something that we should certainly always reflect upon in understanding that. The one thing we also understand about God, and as we paint that picture, and as we've looked at all of these other distinct characteristics, is that God is a God that's all-knowing. In accordance with his judgment, we need to fully comprehend that he is all-knowing and all-understanding. The psalmist wrote, he counts the number of the stars. Have you ever looked at the stars at night on a really dark night where the sky is clear? You don't even begin to attempt to count the stars. One, you couldn't find your place. But two, to, to, to be able to even number those things, he counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. He understanding is, his understanding is infinite, Psalm 147, 4 and 5. In the New Testament, we find that, that known to God from eternity are all his works, Acts 15 and verse 18. Nothing is hidden from the eyes of the Lord. There's no sin, nothing that we can hide or keep from him because God is all-knowing. God is also omnipresent. That means God is everywhere around us. Additionally, because God is everywhere, we're understanding that God is watching us. The inspired psalmist wrote, Where can I go from your spirit? Or or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And your right hand shall lead me, Psalm 139, 7 through 10. And certainly we can understand that God is everywhere. We can look around our surroundings and see that God is everywhere. He's also omnipotent. That that means he's all-powerful. Toward the end of the book of Job, we find God questioning Job about his creation and of his power. And afterward, Job's remarks in chapter chapter 42 and verse 2, he says, I know that you do everything, God. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. The only limits on God's power are those things that go against his very nature. Jesus reminds us that with men this is impossible. With God all things are possible, Matthew 19, 26. And so God alone has the power to conquer both sin and death. He showed us that he conquered death through the cross of Calvary and what Jesus Christ did for us. You know what I'm really thankful for though is that God is unchanging. He's not hypocritical in who he is and how he designs us to be in that relationship with him. He's not going to change his mind later and says, you know what, nah, I don't want to do this anymore. God is unchanging. He's always is and always will be the same. The, perfect, the perfection of God demands that he is unchanging. And because all change for better or worse, and that's the way we see life around us, God never changes. 
You know, as we get older and as we progress and as we mature and as we gain wisdom, we perhaps change in the way we think and the way we do things. Perhaps our temperament changes. Yet God stays the same forever now and always. You see, there's no need for God to change. That should be reassuring for those who, who are obedient to his word that once we become members of the body of Christ, as we've been baptized into the precious blood of the Lamb, that as we're raised to walk in newness of life, as Paul talks about, that God isn't going to turn around and go, huh, oh, whoops, nah, it really didn't mean that. Because that's not how God operates. The promises of God has made us to, to, to be kept. God wants us to keep his promises because God will keep his promises into the bargain. In Malachi 3 and verse 6 we read, for I am the Lord, I do not change. And so certainly that should be reassuring to us. James observed for every good and perfect gift, what? Is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning, James 4 7 or James 1 and verse 17. I think as Christians, as God's children, we should find comfort as we've painted this picture of who God is. And certainly we don't know what he looks like, but we get a portrait of who he is in his character, in his love, in his creation, in his, in his holiness, in his all-knowing, in his all-presence. We get a good picture of who God is. And when we think about this, the promise that made the first century Christians are still applicable to Christians today, right? God does not change and I'm grateful that God doesn't change that that's not even been touched the hem of the garment when we think about the nature of God but one can rest assured that an accurate portrait of God produces knowledge and obedience and when we understand these few characteristics we get a better picture of the God that loves us all we have to do is look to Calvary and so had had all of those things not transpired at Calvary, certainly we can stand back and say, maybe, maybe God isn't the God he says he is, but that's not the case. God is the same now, forever, and always will be the God that he tells us that he is because God is always and will always keep his promise to us. We could bank on that. And I certainly pray as you've painted that portrait today that you see how important it is to be part of what God wants us to be. He wants us to be his children. He wants us to be part of the body in which Jesus Christ died for, whom he is also the head of. And so today, if you desire to be part of that body, I encourage you to reach out to us that you might know that if I follow those things which God instructs me to do because I love him, because he is just, because he keeps his promises, because he shows me through his creation who he is and how holy and wonderful he is, then I know that I want to follow through with that by being baptized for the remission of my sins. First, putting my past behind me, confessing my faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and having all of my past sins washed away. But also the wonderful thing about a loving God that we've noted in his characteristics is that he does love us, and as Christians, when we do make mistakes, that we can walk in the light as his son does and we can be forgiven of those mistakes that transpire in our lives sometimes. When we fall short of his glory, we can bring it back to center. So if you need any of those things, please reach out to us. And you can find all of our information on our website at carycoc.org. For our church family that's watching online, thank you so much for being present today. And I certainly look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Take care and have a wonderful and blessed week. I serve a
you are visiting with us this evening, we want to let you know that you are a special guest. Please stick around after services. Uh, let us shake your hand and get to know you a little bit more and invite you back to our next point in time here at Cary, uh, which is our midweek Bible study on Wednesday at 730. Uh, if you were not able to partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, this morning is prepared for you in the back in room 12. You can exit as we sing this final song. Last song we sing before we let in our prayer be number 714. Trust and obey. 715. When we walk with the pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that has been ours to worship you. Father, we're grateful for all that you give us, and we certainly pray as we've entered into that worship that we've done everything according to your name and your glory. Father, we thank you for the privilege, uh, just simply that you call us your children. Father, we pray as we now enter into this new week that you'll be with us, give us strength and courage as we approach those who need to hear your life-saving message, but also those who are certainly struggling at this time because of what we're experiencing. Father, we pray you continue to bless our, our church family at Cary. pray you'll watch over those who are hurting and suffering, whether it's physically, spiritually, or mentally, that you'll give them those things they need, certainly, whether it's uh, through your providential hand or whether it's through someone that can provide something for them. We pray that that will be, the, be your will. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for all that you give us. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus. In his name we do pray. Amen. 